Amen. Glad you all are here in the house of the Lord where we are going to talk about the church this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14, 15, and 16. The church permeates society. What does permeate mean? That's a big word. It means to pervade. What does pervade mean? <laughs> it means to pass through. Like the smell of food permeates the house on Thanksgiving, you know. It passes through everything. The church, the followers of Jesus Christ, seem to be the dregs of society anymore. According to the media, we are narrow-minded, bigoted haters of progressive thinking. According to the government, Christians and the church are holding back the world from socialistic, anti-God, one-world government agenda. According to the universities, we are a bane on society, as they call religion, the opium of the people, which holds back knowledge and advancement of society and the humanistic agenda. But because we have permeated society, the government, the media, the universities, education has to deal with us because they have to destroy us, subvert us, or quiet us in order to have their way. We're the focus of the world agenda because everything they try to do against the Word of God is against the Word of God that the church follows. So as they try to uh, destroy the church, we already got it started. <laughs> The Word of God is what the church follows. So the agenda of the world is to destroy the church, to get rid of us. they got to get rid of the smell that has permeated all of their society. They think the church is a, is a foul odor to the world. Does Christianity really hold back society as they believe? I would argue that the church makes society better at every level. Amen. Most all mo uh, media moguls, the guys that started TV and the movies, you know who they were? Children of Jewish immigrants. Governments, the United States government, and all governments are ordained of God, established by God. Our government and constitution was based on Judeo-Christian and biblical principles. What happened? All universities were started by churches. All schools were started by churches. That means the study of science was begun by Christians. The greatest scientist of all is Galileo. He was a Christian. In fact, education was encouraged and schools run by churches. You know... All hospitals, welfare programs were one run by and established by churches. We get our moral law from the Bible through the church. The first pilgrims to this land were Christians and church members. The church, the church, every president but one has been a church member. You know who that one is? It's not Obama, no. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln was not a church member. But he espoused more about Christianity and prayer and the Word of God than any president. The Bible tells us that evil men shall wax worse and worse. Over time, the knowledge of God has been suppressed by the powers that be. Romans 1.28 And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, I'm getting the 2 Corinthians here in a minute, so hang in. God gave, gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. With seemingly all the world against the church of Jesus Christ, with all the enemies of God and lovers of darkness rallying against the church, what chance do we have? There's only one thing that we can do. Occupy until the Lord come. Wait for our victory. God has already assured us that we will win. If you want to be on the winning team, you better get from the outside of the church into the church through faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and you're a winner. I don't care what they say about you out there or what they do to you. 
You are a winner in Christ and in His church. If you're in Christ, you're automatically in the church, right? How can we win though? How can God assure us? Everything's against us. I don't feel very victorious, do you? Now let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. And see how the church has permeated society and how it's going to have victory. Verse 14 says that we will triumph. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Always means what? Always means in every way, in every, uh, everything, in every way, every minute of every day, we are victorious. Everything in every way, every minute of every day, we are victorious in Christ. I could quit right there. And we could go home happy. Amen? Amen. Even with sickness, we are victorious. Even in despair, Jesus, com Jesus comforts us. Even in death, we have the victory over the grave, for we will be with our Lord. Amen. Even in the loss of a job, we have the victory because God has promised to meet our need, to never leave us nor forsake us, and to work out all things for our good and for His glory. We will triumph. We are triumphant because He is triumphant. God has permeated society with the church. There is one on every corner in America. God is on His throne today. And He's coming for His church to complete joy and victory. Luke 12, 32 says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God is pleased to come for you and to bring you into His presence and His kingdom. God's victories of over sin, death, hell, and the grave is the gospel. That should be permeated. All of, that has permeated and should permeate all of society. But it has been suppressed by man's evil. The gospel spread has been suppressed by the evil of man. Romans 1.28 They did not like to retain God in their knowledge and in turn have cursed people down through the ages. One day the gospel will permeate every people, nation, and tongue. Every person shall hear the gospel of Jesus Christ during the tribulation. 144,000 Jewish evangelists, three angels, two witnesses. We'll make sure every person hears the gospel. Matthew tells us that. That the gospel will be heard by every creature. Then the Lord will come. You know, when armies battle at night, I studied the Civil War and they never made any movements at night. They didn't draw battle lines at night. They waited till the morning. And then they went to battle for victory. They drew the battle lines and figured out where everybody was at. And they started their march to victory. Listen, the church is in the night. We're not in darkness, but it's nighttime of the church right now. But victory will dawn upon us in the morning. Victory is ours in the morning. The church is working behind the lines through Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are planning, that's already been planned out, victory is assured. Just because it's nighttime, a little darkness, we can't panic as a church. We're going to have victory. Victory will come in the morning. Victory in Jesus permeates society because His prophetic word is being fulfilled as we sit here today. Oh no, here comes prophecy. Yes, here it comes. Buckle your pew belt. Here it comes. God is in control and even allowing evil men to gain control of some things. But make no mistake, God is permeating society even in His presence in fulfilled prophecy. And the lining up of end time events is happening. Amen. It's happening. It's really happening. Russia, Iran, Turkey. Turkey wants to align with Russia exactly as Ezekiel 38 and 39. Here's your assignment for next week. Read Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39. And then get you a study Bible and let it tell you. Well, you don't, don't really have to have a study Bible. It tells you plainly who these nations are. It says Persia is Iran. 
Turkey and Russia are described. They're lining up now. This is an end time battle to come over Jerusalem and Israel. Over Israel's spoil. Israel just last week are planning on a, an attack. They are getting ready for attack. They know it's coming. You know that in 1967, Golda Meir was the uh, Prime Minister of Israel. June 1967, she called the President of the United States at 3 o'clock in the morning and the President, Richard Nixon, his aide said, the president, Mr. President, Golda Meir was, wants you. She's the Prime Minister of Israel. They were being attacked, a sneak attack, by the, their neighbors. They were going to destroy Israel and take over Jerusalem once and for all. And Golda Meir said, Mr. President, if you don't help us, we will not exist in 24 hours. Richard Nixon said, Golda, I'll send you everything we can within the hour. It will be on its way. She said, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, why are you so anxious to help Israel? He said, because my mother used to read the Bible to me every day after school, and she always read to me the stories of Israel. And she said, Richard, I don't know what's going to happen to you in the future, but if you ever have a chance to help Israel, do it. I was a nine-year-old boy, and he said, this is my opportunity to answer my mother's request. And I'll send you everything I have. The United States shipped stuff over within the hour. They had it in the air, headed for Israel in boats, whatever was nearby. They got them the equipment they needed, and they routed the Muslim Arabs within, how long, six-day war? Six days? Listen, what would happen if Netanyahu called our president at 3 o'clock in the morning? We know what would happen. Israel has no friend here. Listen, Israel is going to be attacked. And Ezekiel 38 says, and 39, God will defend them. God used the United States, but He can't anymore. He's written Ichabod. Not Ichabod Crane. <laughs> you know what Ichabod means? The glory of the Lord has departed. I don't want to be a part of that. I want to be in the church. That permeates society. It affects society. The Christians, we don't hunker uh, down. We're not hiding inside these buildings. We don't hunker down. We start more churches. Christians don't run and hide. We die for our faith. Boldly. Christians don't hide in terror, in fear. We trust the Lord in everything and continue to preach the gospel of grace every day in every way. Christians don't run and hide. We trust in the Lord. Now there's times where we have to, to even have a church hide and have it in secret. But we still go out and preach the gospel. In China, churches are illegal. You have to have an underground. There's more churches and Christians in China, more churches in China, just about than the United States. We ought to be, uh, instead of building mega churches, why don't we build churches? Churches. There should be, instead of a church with 35,000, there should be 35,000 churches with 35. Amen. We want to gang up and uh, pay the pastor a big salary so he can have his big hair and his gold chains. I need some big hair. I need some, I definitely can use a gold chain. I mean, what's the matter with you guys? I mean, come on. I'm definitely fat enough. I mean, I'm a big fat preacher. Uh, we will triumph. Secondly, God has permeated society with the church. Look at the rest of 14. And maketh manifest the Savior of His knowledge by us in every place. And through us spreads and makes evident everywhere the sweet, sweet fragrance of the knowledge of Him. God makes the knowledge of Christ evident to the world through the church. It was first Israel. Israel was the nation that was to give God, give testimony that God is in the world. They gave the testimony of what God required. It was Israel that was God's testimony to the world. Now it's the church. Israel is silent. 
until the next se the last seven years of the, of the tribulation. The church right now is God's means of communicating, permeating society. It's the church. That's what Jesus is to all of us. Verse 15, a sweet Savior. For we are unto God a sweet Savior of Christ in them that are saved, in them and in them that perish. People that are saved are a sweet Savior to God. You smell good to God because you put on Christ. You put away the filthiness of sin, the ugliness of sin, the stench of sin, and you put your faith in Christ. And the people that are perishing, that is, do not know Christ as their Savior, you are a sweet smell to them of the opportunity they have to put their faith and trust in Christ. You are the answer they're looking for. They want to be like you. As far as your salvation, your walk with God, they want to be like you. Listen. In verse 15, it is Paul who was a sweet smell to God for his faithfulness in preaching the gospel. You ever walked into a chocolate factory? Ever walked into a chocolate factory? The smell, I'm told, is unbelievably, unbelievably pleasant. Say that again. Unbelievably smells good. <laughs> Have you ever walked into a pizza shop? Unbelievably wonderful, right? <laughs> Have you ever fallen into a sewer? Had a cousin that was playing in the backyard. Mamma and Papa had the sewer open, you know, back then in those days. Just ran in the creek, had a big ditch. And, of course, he, so awkward, he was a teenager, fell right into it. He came in and cried, Mamma! Now he was covered from head to toe. He smelled unbelievably bad. Did we run to him, give him a hug? No way. Even the dogs wouldn't go around him. It was bad. My poor mamma, you know what she did? She said, let's go down the creek. She threw him in the creek <laughs> and washed him off. Smells put us in a mood, you know. Uh, you don't, don't you just love to smell that Thanksgiving turkey? Don't you love the smell of Christmas? Fresh pine, cookies, baking, gingerbread, cold winter air, chestnuts roasting on an open fire. I really don't know what that smells like, but it's got a nice ring to it. It reminds us of good things, happy things, safe things, family things, things we love. That's what Jesus is to us. A sweet-smelling savor. Reminding of His presence. A reminder of His presence in our lives. His goodness, His joy, His protection, His love. That's what Jesus is to us. He is so sweet. Just His name is so sweet. You ever wonder what the smells of heaven will be like? You like walking into these nice stores that smell so good. They want you to, anything they can do to make it a pleasurable, pleasurable experience is what a store will do. And they, they want to smell good. That's one of the things. And uh, that's what heaven will be like. Everything pleasurable, even the smells. You know that smell? When I was away on trips, anything I smelled, it smelled like home just made me think of home. And it's, it's what the, the heaven is to us. It's a sweet smell. No fear. No worry. You smell something good and you're attracted to it. We run from a skunk, but we run to a Thanksgiving turkey, right? We run from cooked cabbage and spinach, but we run to fresh baked pie. We attract others to Christ by the sweet savor of our Lord Jesus, permeating our lives. He is sweet. He is our Lord. He's our Savior. And we attract others to Him. We are attracted to Him. It's all because of Christ. Look at verse 16. God has permeated society. Verse 16. Something stinks though. Verse 16. To the one we are Savior of death unto death and to another Savior of life unto life. The leader in a Roman procession was followed by priests dispensing incense. Officers, soldiers, and captives. The aroma of the event represented victorious life to the soldiers and slavery or death to the captives. In the same way, the gospel message gives life to those who accept it, but it represents death to those who reject it. Death has permeated all society because we all have an appointment with death. Hebrews 9.27 tells us that. Death has touched every family, every home. As I said, no Christian really can smell bad because we have Christ. 
But death always stinks. Death is a foul odor to God. There's nothing worse than the smell of death. Do you know that if you haven't trusted in Christ, you're already dead in trespasses and sins? Did you know that if you've never trusted in Christ, to God you have the foul smell of death? Ephesians 2, 1, you with yet, who hath, And you hath He quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Colossians 2, 13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. That brings us to the obvious question. Why did God use incense in the tabernacle in the temple? Aaron was instructed to burn incense on the altar each morning and at twilight every day as a regular offering to the Lord to cover the stench of death on the sacrificial altar. Exodus 30 verses 7 through 8 tells us that. God gave, God gave the recipe for making the incense and stipulated that no other incense ever be burned on the altar. Exodus 30 verses 34 through 38. The fire used to burn the incense was always taken from the altar, a burnt offering outside the sanctuary. Taken outside the sanctuary. Leviticus 16.12 Never was the altar of incense to be used for a burnt offering or grain offering or a drink offering. Exodus 39. 30 verse 9. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was to put blood on the horns of the altar of incense to cleanse it. The altar of incense was called most holy to the Lord. Exodus 30 verse 10. With these offerings we look to Christ who died for our sins. But it was a sweet smell to God because Christ was the only death ever died. Is that a proper way to say it? That brought life. Because as the smell of death is covered by incense, so the smell of death is covered by the sweetness, the innocence of Jesus Christ. We die, we're dead in trespasses and sins, but because of Christ, this sweet aroma to God can give life to everyone. You see, it's the Father's good will to save you. He's not willing that any should perish. Remember that the burnt offerings of lambs and bullocks was a sweet-smelling savor to God? Even the Jewish offerings on the altar were sweet to God as we look forward to Christ. Exodus 29, uh, 29 18. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor. An offering made by fire unto the Lord. The incense was used, well, or rather was sent up to cover the smell of death and to look forward to the sweet smelling aroma of the sacrifice of Christ that covered the stench of our sins and of the death of and of the grave. That's what incense was used for. A symbol of Christ. Incense also is associated with prayer. David said, "My prayer, may my prayer be set before you like incense. Psalm 141.2 In his vision of heaven, John saw the elders around the throne were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of of God's people. Amen. Revelation 5, 8 and 8, 3. As Zechariah the priest was offering incense in the temple, Luke 1, 10, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. The altar of incense can also be seen as a picture of the intercession of Christ. Christ praying for us. Just as the altar of sacrifice in the courtyard was a type of Christ's death on our behalf, the altar of incense in the holy place was a type of Christ's Mediation on our behalf. Christ's work on earth and in heaven. Christ's work on earth and heaven now is to be our mediator. He stands for us and with us. He prays for us. The altar of incense was situated before the mercy seat of the ark. A picture of our advocate standing in the presence of the Father. Hebrews 7.25 and 9.24 the incense was to be burning continually on the altar of incense, which shows the perpetual, perpetual nature of Christ's mediation. Christ never rests. He never sleeps. He always is ready to mediate for you and take care of you and come to you. Never sleeps. Christ's intercession on our behalf is a sweet-smelling savor to God. So Christ's sacrifice for our sins is a sweet-smelling savor to God. Those who trust in Christ are a sweet-smelling savor to God. Our service for Christ is a sweet-smelling savor to God. Our prayers are a sweet-smelling savor to God. No matter how much people try to get rid of God, Jesus Christ, the Bible, and Israel, and the church, 
the more the sweet-smelling savor of Jesus Christ permeates the world. When something stinks, the more the sweet smells good. That's why you spray air freshener in the bathroom. Right? <laughs> this world stinks because Jesus makes it smell good. We wouldn't know how stinky it was if we didn't know Christ and how good He is. When the church is raptured away, think about this, when the sweet-smelling aroma of the church is raptured away, this world will be filled with the stench of fire, burning, destruction, disaster, and death. I don't know about you, but I don't want to hang around for that. Trust Christ now. Death and the Antichrist agenda will permeate the world then. You know, the devil always copies what God does. Always. The church permeates the world through the Holy Spirit. Satan will permeate the world with death. Jesus permeates the world with life. Jesus stands for life. He's the light of the world. Jesus permeates the world with life and light and joy and peace and hope. Satan will bring the world permeated with death and darkness and sadness, depression, destruction. You want to hang around for that and take a chance? Now Jesus could come and get His church any moment. You want to hang around with, for that? Jack, you're being very depressing. Good. Because you need to turn to Jesus and have joy. You need to come to the Lord. It's getting late, people. It's getting late. Christ didn't tell us ever to be discouraged. He said, come unto Me. Come unto Me. Now, none of us are going to be dancing with joy and dancing a jig every day. That's impossible. But we can try. <laughs> we have joy in the Lord. We have hope in the Lord. Listen, it's going to get bad, but He is going to get better. It's going to get awful, but He's going to be greater. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. Let me close. The church is the one who God, through Jesus Christ, told to go into all the world. The church is built by Jesus Christ. The church, Jesus said, He would build and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell are coming up. You know what that means? The gates are like a truck backing up, ready to load people onto it, who've quit God and have quit. The more atheists alive today, I read a report that said 51% of Christians are now atheists. What? Where did they get that from? I don't believe it. I think it's a lie. I think it's more like 49%. <laughs> but uh, what happened to these people? They never were saved in the first place. I don't believe you, you can't lose your salvation, so they never did have it. So this, the gates of hell are backing up their loading van. Allied Atlas van. Remember, Truth of Consequences advertised Atlas van lines. I can just see that church, big orange, that, that truck, that big orange truck, backing up, waiting to load up everybody that wants to get off the church or get off God or to. I'm sick and tired of Christians messing up everything. I've heard people say that before. I was in a meeting and I heard this lady whispering to another, if it wasn't for the church, this world would be a lot better off. She actually believed that. A person from eastern Kentucky. That was 15 years ago. She died three years later. I'm not saying that's why, but I'm just saying she needed somebody. I think she came to Christ is what somebody told me before she passed away. She came to faith in Christ because God doesn't get mad at you what you say about Him. He just wants you to come to Him. That's right. He forgives you. The church marches on. Are you marching with them on the narrow road? Or are you marching on the broad road filled with those who have rejected their message and going to get on the truck to the lake of fire? The gates of hell are waiting for you. The gates of hell are wide open. But the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. They can back it up all day, all around us. Nobody getting on it. Because we've got something better. We have the Lord. We have God. We have Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior.
who will protect us and guide us and give us peace and joy. Amen. Let's pray.